From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Make me a vessel, make me an offering. 
Welcome to NCC Online. My name is Pastor Rob. Glad to be with you today as we continue our series called Will God Still Love Me If? <clears throat> I was doing a Google search on this question because Google, of course, will autocomplete your sentence. If you type in, Will God Still Love Me If? It will guess what you're going to say. And, of course, that's an algorithm. It's based on what people actually ask and the top answers were very interesting so i wrote them down and the top six autofills for google will god still love me if were as follows will god still love me if i sin that didn't really surprise me that's kind of what we talked about in week one will god still love me if i mess up if i'm not a virgin was the second one if i get a divorce probably a lot of people curious about that relationally if I don't go to church, if I get a tattoo, if I smoke, and if I smoke weed. So those were the top seven answers for the Google autocomplete. People want to know, when will God stop loving me? Is there a limit to his affection? Can I lose my salvation is probably involved with that question. And, of course, the place we go now to ask that is not 
the Bible or to our churches. We ask that to Google because Google knows everything. At least that's how we feel. And unfortunately, you're not going to find the best answers Googling that. Maybe you've even Googled that question. Will God still love me if? And I would like to say loud and clear to you today, the answer to all of those seven questions and all the others is a resounding yes. God will still love you. He, he will still take you back. He, he will still be with you. And today I want to ask another one of these questions, perhaps an even bigger one than the ones we've asked, which is, will God still love me, though, if I turn away from him? What if I abandon him? What if I disown him? What if I walk away from him? What if I betray him? This is, this is, a, this is a big, tough question in the Bible. And, and as usual, I want to answer it with a specific person in mind. It's the Apostle Peter, because I, I just believe his story is one that all of us can relate to at a certain level. I, I think that we can all put ourselves in Peter's shoes at different parts of his story, as well as to see what happens next in terms of would God still love Peter after his betrayal? We know that Peter was one of the greatest Christians that ever lived. We know that he was the leader of the early church, the top leader in the book of Acts of all the other disciples. He really did lead the church movement. We know that Jesus changed his name from Simon to Peter, the rock, and said, upon this rock, I will build my church. But that's all mature Peter. That's, that's Acts Peter. Before we see that Peter, we see immature Peter. We see a different picture of Peter. And that's the one I want to talk a little bit today that I think we'll relate to. And before we do, would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you that you love us. And in light of all that's been going on tragically in the world around us, we pray for your healing touch, your understanding, your perspective, your, your peace. We want to pray for just a, a calmness in our souls. We also want to pray for clarity in this topic, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit, not just intellectually, but in our very souls, that you will let us know just how much you care for us and draw sinners back to yourself, draw us closer to Christ, closer to you, closer to your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So what did Peter look like in his immature phase? Well, you probably know. Let me give you some quick overviews that give you a sense of that. And again, I think most of us can relate to some of these in the life of Peter. First of all, this. Peter put fear over faith. He put fear over faith. That was something he did regularly in his life. We see it again and again and again. In fact, I'm convinced after studying Peter that fear before he became mature Peter was his driving motivation. We don't know where that came from, perhaps just from his own human brokenness, like all of us have. Perhaps he was betrayed himself in his life at some level. Maybe it went back to his childhood. I don't know. But I do know that it was there, it was alive, and it was a well. And even as an early follower of Jesus, what we would call a Christian, he was letting fear drive him quite a bit. We see a story in Matthew 14, 27 to 30. And it says this, Jesus said to Peter, and the other disciples, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. This is when Jesus is walking on the water to them in the boat. And Peter, of course, is the one who quickly re replies, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Now, when I've heard this story told, and it's a beautiful story in its own context, of course, Jesus is the hero here, walking on the water, a beautiful miracle, and showing his power to his disciples. But we often give Peter a tremendous amount of credit for his faith, and he actually walks in the water. And that's true, but I don't think that's what the story is telling us. It's actually saying, look, this is Peter being impetuous. This is Peter being impulsive. This is Peter just jumping headlong in, not, not really thinking before he leaped, and ultimately not getting very far before his Fear was drowning him, and Jesus had to save him. This is a picture of Peter's fear, and we see it driving and motivating him as he walks with Jesus. He's regularly afraid all the way to Jesus' death. He's afraid of what will happen to him 
And maybe you can relate to that. I think that's a big fear for all of us. Secondly, Peter really didn't understand grace. And that's a pretty big deal when you're a disciple of Jesus. Grace is really the top conversation from Jesus' parables, the prodigal son, and what he wanted to teach about the love of God, forgiveness, regularly, all the time. Jesus was teaching him. Peter just didn't get it. One time Peter came to Jesus and had this dialogue. He asked him, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Peter is the one that asks us. Now, at one level, again, you can give Peter credit. It's like, wow, he's really good Christian. He wants to forgive up to seven times. But at this point in his life, he, he just really wasn't getting it. Jesus was trying to let him know again and again, no, Peter, there's not a limit on forgiveness. There's not a, there's not a condition here. We are to love other people. And, and this is one of the hardest things, but we do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. We forgive them again and again and again. Not seven times, but 77 times or seven times seven. He was just saying an unlimited amount of times. Peter wanted a limit. He wanted Jesus to say, look, this is the end. I even suspect, because the disciples were regularly feuding with each other, several times in the Gospels we read they were fighting specifically about who's the greatest, and Peter was not above that. He saw himself pretty highly in those early days of his immaturity. I wouldn't be surprised if he had a riff with one of the other disciples. And when he comes to Jesus, perhaps he was asking, how many times do I need to forgive John, you know? Tell me it's only seven times, you know, so I can be done with it because I don't want to forgive him one more time. I don't know, but that's the Peter we see early in the Gospels. He just really didn't understand grace. Thirdly, Peter was not watchful. This is a painful reality. He wasn't vigilant. He wasn't careful. He wasn't serious. He wasn't sober. All the things we read later in the New Testament that he does become, in his early days, he was not those things. The most painful story about this, of course, we read in, in the book of Matthew when Peter and some of the other disciples were there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is on the eve of his death. He's about to give up his life sacrificially for the world. And he's crying tears of blood. And he asks his disciples, his top disciples, especially Peter, his top guys, you know, watch and pray just for a little while because this is a serious time and I, I need to to go one-on-one -on -one with my Heavenly Father. But when he comes back, he sees them, and they're not doing it. The, the disciples are sleeping. A and, and Jesus says, couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Now notice he singles out Peter here. He said, well, that's not fair. The other guys couldn't stay awake either. They weren't vigilant. So, well, that's true. They weren't. They were also pretty immature. But, but Peter is the one he expects more from. And what I see happening here isn't just that Peter isn't being vigilant or watchful, but that Jesus expects him to be by this point. He knows what Peter is capable of, and he's calling it out of him. And he's, if you read the Gospels carefully, you'll see that he's calling out of Peter the man that he designed him to be, the man of God that he ultimately becomes. He's trying to call that out of him. Side note, he wants to call that out of you, man or woman of God. He sees the potential in you because he put it in you at your birth. He gave you spiritual gifts at your conversion. He wants to call that out of you. He wants to get every part of that from you for his glory and your benefit and your blessing. And he's going to keep doing that, pursuing you until the day you die. I guarantee you that. But here we see it. It's Peter who is falling down. Peter who can't stay awake. Peter who's being quite immature. Number four, Peter was a hothead. Yeah, you probably knew that one about Peter. If you've read a little bit about Peter and the guy, you probably knew he had a temper. He, he's, he, he's burning hot all the time. It seems like he's the one to, to quick talk Jesus, to back mouth Jesus, to question Jesus, uh, all kinds of things. But where we really see it take the cake is after the Garden of Gethsemane. Now Jesus is becoming arrested by the soldiers. There was even a high priest there and the high priest's servant is there and this is what happens in john 18 simon peter who had a sword drew it and struck the high priest's servant cutting off his right ear jesus commanded peter put, put your sword away peter now this this is a, a verse that actually gets really overlooked because it's often told around easter and of course we're accentuating the most important thing jesus died on the cross he suffered for us but he also rose from the dead and 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 this is this is like a little tiny throwaway verse but Man, this would have ended any one of us in jail. 
you, you don't just pull out a sword in public and you certainly don't strike it at someone and cut their ear off. That's what Peter did. This is toward the end of Jesus' career, the, really the eve of his death, and Peter is still falling into his same old problems. This is immature Peter. This is hothead Peter. This is, I got a bad temper. Now, let me ask you this. Do you really think Peter was aiming for his ear? I mean, I don't think Peter's aim is that good. I, I think he's just swinging away, and I think he's aiming for the guy's head. I, I believe that Peter has murderous intent in his heart at this point. Now, at the one level, I give him a little bit of credit. He's trying to protect his Lord and his rabbi. I understand that. But at the same time, these are the, this is the law, and, and, and he's not above it. And Jesus, Jesus corrects him. and put that sword away. What are you doing? And we see this hot-headed Peter, the one who is just still making things messy. Maybe you can relate to this, Peter. Maybe you can relate to being with Jesus for a number of years like Peter was and just still feeling like you're not arriving or maybe you're falling into the same old patterns. I, I know I've had those thoughts like, man, it takes me forever to learn these lessons that the Lord wants to teach me. That's very human and you're not alone in that. That's how you feel. Know that that is quite normal, quite regular, regular, that we are slow to learn the way of the Lord, but he will break through. He will have his way with, with us, his followers. But then comes the moment that is really the worst moment of Peter's life. It's worse than any of the ones I've mentioned by far because Jesus isn't just arrested. He's brought before the council. It's a mock trial. They're throwing the book at him. They already have convicted him even before they've looked at any evidence. There's, there's no evidence other than them accusing him of blasphemy for, for claiming to be God. But of course he was God. And you may be aware of what happens with Peter. He's afraid again. He's wandering. He's, he, he's fleeing. He's, you know, hiding. He's, he's doing all the things you do when you're afraid. And as he wanders around and kind of trails Jesus to see what's happening, he's confronted three separate times, just as Jesus predicted in the Last Supper. And each of those times, the confrontation is, weren't you with Jesus? Weren't you one of his disciples? Weren't you one of his? In other words, weren't you included in probably implied is you're about to get arrested too. And Peter flatly denies it. No, he lies to their face. I wasn't a part of that. And he denies even knowing Jesus. I don't even know that man. It's an awful betrayal right at the hour of Jesus' need. Instead of showing loyalty, showing character, showing his affection for Jesus, he does the opposite of what he wants to do. And Matthew, his account of what happens, he lets us know precisely how Peter felt afterwards, as you could imagine. It says, and he went outside and wept bitterly. Peter was very sad about his own actions. In fact, this was hitting rock bottom. He probably wanted to harm himself. He, he was so depressed. He couldn't believe the man that he had become. He thought he was walking with Jesus. He thought he was growing in his faith, and now he had betrayed him. He had completely walked away from him. Perhaps he thought he was beyond redemption. In fact, I'm sure the question coming in his mind, will God still love me if I did this? And I think his answer was, there's no way. There's no way that Jesus will forgive me. There's no way that the Father will forgive me for what I've done. I, I'm done for I might as well just walk away from my faith. That, I believe, is what's going on in the description of what Peter feels and, and, and what he does. Maybe you've wondered this question in your own life. Before I go any further, maybe you've wondered if you've done something beyond redemption. The worst thing. Maybe, maybe it's walking away from Jesus. Maybe you had a season in your life. It might have been back in high school or in college or if you went to the military and you just lived your own way and you did some bad things and you were way apart from God. Maybe you're trying to find your way back to God now, but you're wondering, could God really forgive me for my past? Maybe you're walked, you've walked away from God now and your current state is a betrayal of Jesus in some way. And you're wondering, can he still love me? Well, we find out the answer because in John 21, we see another snapshot into Peter's life. So this one is really the turning point. This is where it starts to get better. And 
this is after Jesus has been resurrected. So Jesus gets arrested. He gets thrown to the courts. They find him guilty. They crucify him, of course, and he dies on the cross for all of our sins to take our penalty for us, you and me included. But then he rises from the dead on the third day and he's wandering around. He's seeing people and he's, he, he's revealing himself to the people. And on, in John 21, Peter, I think, is still in a bit of flux and he goes out fishing with some of the other disciples. And even that little detail in the text is important because we know that Peter at this point had sort of given that life up. You remember when Jesus first called Peter? What does he say? He says, look, you, you were a fisherman, but now you're going to be a fisher of men. In other words, you don't, you're, this isn't your occupation anymore. Come and follow me. And Peter resoundingly says yes. So the fact that now after Peter's betrayal, he's back fishing, I believe is just him saying, you know, I, I got to go back to what I knew. This is how I put food on the table, literally. And I, I have denied Jesus. I, I have burned him too bad. I'm no longer... Perhaps he's thinking, I'm no longer a follower of Jesus or a disciple. But on that particular day, uh, they're fishing and Jesus shows up. And the text says that he's on the shore and they're out in the boat. And it says there's about 100 yards distance. That's about a football field. So it's pretty far. Now it's close enough that over the water they can hear Jesus, but they can't really see him. And they don't know who it is. The text says they don't recognize him. And he's on the shore, and he essentially asks them, hey, did you catch anything? And they said, no. And he says, well, try the other side of the boat. And they had nothing to lose. So it's like, okay. So they take their nets, and they throw them on the other side of the boat, still not knowing it's Jesus, can't see him, don't recognize him. Perhaps God blinded their eyes. I don't know. And amazingly, when they obey this stranger, they put the nets on the other side that the fish just start jumping in the nets. And so much so that the, the nets are so heavy that they can't even pull the net in the, in the boat. It's, it's just an amazing catch of fish. And as, of course, when this miracle happens, uh, John recognizes it first in the text. It says, John says, this is the Lord. It's the Lord. It has to be. There's no, no one else who does this. And, and side note, I just picture Jesus on the shore smiling. I don't know, but I just picture him smiling. He loved to, to, to show these kind of uh, mercies and compassions, even practical miracles and healing people and helping people. And here he is just having fish jump in the disciples' nets. He had to have just enjoyed that. And when John says, it's the Lord, Peter, what does he do? He jumps out of the boat. And man, does that ever sound like Peter? He doesn't think. He doesn't ask questions. He just has deep affection for the Lord. And even though he feels broken, and even though he has just come out of a time of betrayal, and he's, he's come out of a time where he was weeping bitterly, perhaps he's wondering if God could even still love him. When Jesus shows up on that shore, and he recognizes who it is, unlike the other disciples who just stay in the boat, he jumps into water and swims all the way to shore. Well, then they have a breakfast together. It's a fish fry, naturally. And I'm sure that was just a beautiful time. But after that time, Jesus takes Peter aside and he has a one-on-one -on -one encounter with him. And we call this the reinstatement of Peter. It's a powerful time of forgiveness and healing in the life of Peter that would set up the church for many years to come. And in that time, Jesus asks him a simple question. He asks Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now that question is meant to say, I'm calling you out as the leader of your peers and I want to know that you love me even more than they love me. And even though the other disciples love Jesus, he believed that Peter was still the one. And Peter says, yes, Lord, yes, you know that I love you. And then Jesus proceeds to ask that question three times, which of course is extremely significant. Each time he asks it, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. That is a threefold reinstatement of Peter. Just as Peter denied Jesus three times, I never knew him. Jesus gives Peter the opportunity to, to love him three times. And that detail, there's no way that's missed on Peter. In fact, in the text, you see Peter by the third time feeling quite sad again 
because Jesus asked him a third time. But there's another thing going on in the text that doesn't meet the eye when you're reading it in English. And I, I need to caveat it by saying there are s probably several different theological takes on this. I'm just going to give you my theological take on this. But in the text, the word for love changes, and you can't see that in the English. So when Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these? He's using this big, powerful word, agape. And you've probably heard that word, agape. It's a, it's a biblical love. It's sacrificial love. It's the love of God. It's sometimes called an unconditional love. It's the love that's used in John 3, 16, when God says, For God so loved agape the world, you and me, that he gave his only begotten son on our behalf. He sacrificed himself for us. He loved us in a different kind of way, in a godly way. That's the word Jesus uses when he says, Peter, do you agape love me? But when Peter replies to that question the first time, he says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. He uses a different word. This is a good word too for love, but it's friendship. It's familial. It's my buddy. It's just a little bit lower. In my view, I think what's happening is Peter is still so hurt by his own betrayal, he is not allowing himself to use the powerful big word that Jesus used, agape. He doesn't believe he can live up to God's standards. He doesn't believe that he can be the person that Jesus wants him to be. So when Jesus says, do you love me, agape love? He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But he says, you know that I like you. Now imagine for a minute, just to think about that word a little bit further, that I'm having a conversation with my wife. You know, it's a romantic moment. Now, of course, Jesus' example, was this is not a romantic kind of love, but, but between my wife and I, let's say it was. And I say, Lisa, you, you, do you, you know how much I love you? And she says, yes, I know that you love me. She says, do you love me? And she says, yes, you know that I like you. I got to tell you, I'd be pretty disappointed <laughs> about that. You could understand why. Or the young man who finally gets the nerve to say to the woman that he loves, I love you. And she looks back and says, you too. You know, doesn't say it back. Now, this is not a romantic conversation, obviously. But the type of love we're talking about is profound and powerful. And when Jesus says, Peter, do you agape love me? He says, phileo, I think there's something going on here. So Jesus asked the same question a second time. He says, Peter, do you agape love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. He says phileo again. And then the third time, Jesus changes the word. And he says, Peter, do you phileo love me? And then the text says, and Peter was sad. Because Jesus asked, do you phileo love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love you. And you see there Jesus accommodating Peter, coming down to his level, as he does for all of us, trying to lift us up to his level, and yet willing to come down to ours. And Peter is sad because he wants to be in the agape love category, but he doesn't think he can do it. All he can do is offer his phileo love to the Savior. But Jesus is saying, I believe it's enough. Do you phileo love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know that. I, and I think if we could hear that in the original language, we would just be so moved by it, but also see it for ourselves. Why it's so powerful in our own Christian walk and our relationship with Christ. Because... God still loves Peter, even though he's betrayed him. Not only that, but he reinstates him. Not only that, but he allows him to become one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, leads the church age, and helps the mission of God into the future all the way to this current day. It's an amazing story. And then the text ends this way. Jesus gives Peter an insight into what is to come. Right after the, this exchange, John 21, uh, Jesus says, Very truly, I tell you, Peter, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to, to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Now, what's happening here is Jesus then, after the exchange, prophesied to Peter what kind of death he would die. 
And, and the details are that he's going to have someone else dress him, lead, lead him where he doesn't want to go, and they're going to stretch out his hands. And now we're never told in the Bible, how does Peter die? But several renowned historians tell us what happened. And it's not in the Bible, but they say, each one of them, that Peter is later martyred for his impressive faith in God. He, he, his faith is so vibrant, and of course we know that's true from the New Testament, that he's killed for it. And when he's killed, he's crucified. They put prison clothes on him. They change his dress. They lead him where he doesn't want to go, all the way to his crucifixion where they spread out his arms. It's also said that Peter would not allow himself to be crucified right side up because he didn't deserve to be killed the way Jesus was killed. And they crucified him upside down. Now, we don't know if all those details are exactly what happened, but we do see how Jesus prophesied how Peter would die. And it sure sounds like it would fit to me. Why is that so important? This isn't a negative thing. This isn't Jesus saying something very terrible or tragic. No, it's just the opposite. He is telling Peter, you will arrive at agape love. After Peter just says, phileo, 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 three times, and says, yes, Lord, you know that I familiar, familiar love you. He says, no, yeah, but Peter, one day you're going to be this person who you want to be. You are actually going to be someone who dies for what they believe in. You're going to have a sacrificial love for me. And I believe Jesus is giving them a glimpse of his future. And as we wrap up today, perhaps God wants to give you a glimpse of your future. That he wants to let you know that it's not too late. It's not over. You might be in a state of sadness or, or weeping or where Peter was, or maybe you're just in a, in a middle ground state, or maybe you don't know where you're at, but Jesus wants you to come back. And today's the day to say, Lord, I do love you. Help me to love you in an unconditional way by your Holy Spirit. Give me the life that you want. And I'd like to pray for you as we close. Lord, for each one listening in right now, no matter what he or she is going through, that you would do a profound and powerful work in his or her life, just as you did for Peter and for me and so many others. That you would call us out of our old life. You would forgive us of our sins. And you would set us on a path for the purpose you've put us on earth to glorify you and to follow you and have an abundant life. May each one listening in know that you are real, you love them, and you're calling them back to yourself. May this be the day that many come to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, thanking you for what you've done. Amen. Hey, thanks, church, for, for being here, for listening in. Hope you come back next week for the, for the big conclusion of this series, Will God Still Love Me If? We'll see you then.